Hi, everyone, and welcome to Behind the Numbers. My name is Dave Bookbinder. I'm a managing director at B. Riley Financial, and I'm also the author of the new ROI, Return on Individuals. And welcome to the show where we dig deeper to understand what matters most in business. Today, I'm excited to have a conversation with uh, someone who's here to share his entrepreneurial journey with us. Pleased to welcome Monik Suri, who is the founder and CEO of Therma. Monik, welcome to Behind the Numbers. Great to be here, Dave. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Why don't you introduce yourself to the audience? Awesome. Well, uh, great to meet you folks. Thanks for taking the time. My name is Monik. I'm the founder and CEO at Therma. We are a clean cooling company trying to transform the refrigeration sector, uh, turning a, a significant source of inefficiency and waste and ultimately emissions into a, a profit center and some something that can actually help be part of the solution to the climate crisis. Um, early stage company based in the Bay Area. Um, I grew up in California, spent a lot of time on the East Coast in investing in government and now back uh, building a tech startup. Great to be here. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you. And I, I want to start by it, talking about the, uh, the climate crisis situation. Talk a little bit about that and where does Therma fit into the solution? Yeah, absolutely, Dave. Well, I, uh, I think many folks these days are talking about the, the challenge we face uh, in, in, in terms of the global warming acceleration. The, the problem, I think, is that there are so many different sources of the problem that it's hard to know where to begin. It's not like a, a single silver bullet exists to eliminate or prevent global warming from uh, changing our quality of life and potentially making it hard for people to enjoy the same standard of living that we've had for the last few decades. Uh, we're focused on one area that we think is underserved, which is the combination of waste across product spoilage, energy consumption, and refrigerant leaks that happen in refrigeration. So when you think about the cold supply chain, all the refrigeration assets out there, they cause and are responsible for emissions in three areas food and product spoilage and waste, which if it were a country would be the fourth largest emitter on a standalone basis, which is kind of crazy. A third of all food that gets made is thrown out before it, uh, it gets consumed. Uh, secondly, the energy consumption. Refrigeration is one of the single largest sources of energy consumption, and it's still ultimately a hugely inefficient uh, source of energy use. Most businesses don't turn refrigeration up and down dynamically. They don't take advantage of energy price differences or utility needs. And then the third source of waste and the climate problem that refrigeration touches on is, is refrigerants. These are the chemicals that go into refrigeration and air conditioning that make cooling possible. Well, it turns out that they're actually ultra warming. They cause between 1,000 and 10,000 times the same heating as CO2. And these refrigerants get leaked into the atmosphere throughout the life cycle of a refrigerator or an air conditioning unit. And we're trying to help reduce that leakage um, while making sure the units work well. Um, what's kind of incredible about refrigeration is it's been around for over 100 years, but the vast majority of the planet still doesn't have adequate refrigeration. It's a rapid growth area because so much of the developing world doesn't have that much refrigeration. It's part of the reason why COVID-19 vaccines couldn't reach billions. The ultra temp sensitive vaccines that came out early couldn't get to much of the world's population because there wasn't enough refrigeration cold chain available. That's why fresh fruits and vegetables and other uh, temperature sensitive products are hard for many people to get access to. So we think that refrigeration is a big and untapped source of the problem uh, because it causes a lot of waste and emissions and it's also important for human health and well-being. So obviously we need it. Yeah, and where does Therma fit into the, the solution? We'll talk a little bit about what, what you're actually doing, what's your offering. Yeah, no, uh, a few things that we're doing at Therma. So Therma is short for temperature, humidity, energy, remote monitoring application. We're Tim and nerds, so have to have an acronym. Got to have an acronym. The, <laughs> the technology itself is a combination of hardware, software, and analytics. And so we have a series of sensors. These are uh, the size of a deck of cards. Uh, you drop them in place in refrigeration interiors, fridges, freezers, display cases, low boys, warehouses, and distribution centers. They can work in any cold storage environment. Um, typically, we work with uh, stationary refrigeration, and the sensors get continuous monitoring data on the temperature and humidity of what's going on inside the assets out wirelessly. They reliably and wirelessly push that signal out, which has been hard to do historically. 
Uh, you couldn't do that with earlier generations of sensors. They couldn't get the signal through the side of the fridge or the freezer. The second thing we do is we start making that data available on web and mobile applications for reporting, for operating improvements, to catch spoilage events on nights and weekends, to help alert businesses and owners when refrigeration is looking like it's going to go down and help catch asset failure. And then the third thing we do is provide analytics and, and, and insights. Um, so a few things around that. One, we can help identify overcooling. We can see when people are setting the set points unnecessarily low and burning up uh, energy that they don't need to. Uh, we can also identify asset failure equipment when it's actually starting to go down before it does and, and drive preventative maintenance. And most recently, we started developing uh, refrigeration as a battery. The ability to help businesses turn refrigeration up and down for a few minutes a day, a few times a week. That refrigeration as a battery concept is basically a way to tap your fridge or your freezer like a battery and take advantage of the fact that the product inside uh, can, can stay cold for many hours. And by tapping the battery, by raising the thermostat on the fridge or the freezer for a couple of minutes, you can save huge amounts on your energy bill, depending on when you do that especially because energy prices vary and during weather events and storms, utilities need the extra power. So that's the offering. Yeah, and l let's talk about your, your why for a moment, Monik, because your, your, your offering is uh, a solution to a uh, you know, sustainability issue. We talk about climate change. What about that issue inspired you to pursue this? Well, appreciate that, David. Something I think about a lot as a you know kind of uh, you know an entrepreneur every day. You know why get up early? Why go to bed late? You know it's it's uh, it's definitely a personal uh, you know answer for me. I grew up uh, in in California. I had a chance to live for a few years in India. My parents were from New Delhi, um, and they moved back. We moved back when I was a kid. Uh, so we lived there from when I was seven to ten. My grandparents still live there and i go back just about every year i think going back and forth between the u.s and india as a kid and as an adult i got to see very different qualities of life very different standards of living and one of the things that struck me over the years going back and seeing how the environment and the air quality and the uh the challenges of daily living in a place like delhi were making it hard for people to enjoy going for a walk or a run outside um you know those kinds of uh, observations, you know, the fact that when I go now to, to Delhi, I have a hard time exercising outside. And, and as a result, I'm hesitant to take my, my daughter there. And, you know, she's, she's almost one. And, you know, that, that even that, that feeling that this could be a recurring problem, this is not something that's going to happen only in the developing world or only in large cities and in, in, in certain pockets. It's happening now in many, many parts of the world. I think that realization over the last several years made me much more focused on sustainability as a problem that is worth solving regardless of where you live. And I'm privileged to live in San Francisco and, and, and to have grown up um, you know, in NorCal. But the reality is we had wildfires 35 miles from my parents' house uh, you know, a couple of years ago. Literally, uh, they were evacuating the town uh, right across from where my folks live in California. And you know, we were in Napa a few years ago vacationing when wildfires, the worst in California's history, hit my wife and I. And so I think we're starting to see these extreme weather events, the kinds of impacts on quality of life happening closer to home and making, making at least me and, 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 and uh, you know, my wife realize, well, we want to we wanna have, you know, uh, we want to make an impact on, on, on the way in which our daughter and, and future generations can enjoy the kind of experiences that we had. And so it's really those sets of factors that got me focused at the personal level. Professionally, I was always interested in building tech for good. For the last decade, I've been working on building technology around social problems. And, and so the two kind of uh, impulses or urges uh, have been married here. Yeah, doing well by doing good is a common narrative these days with the ESG investing. And if you've seen anything that I've spoken on or written about, you know that uh, I'm a, a big believer in uh, the doing well by doing good. And there is a huge ROI on that. Um, Monica, I think we have about five minutes to go here in this segment. Before I continue on, I just want to give you a chance to tell the audience how they can reach you if they want to learn more about you or Therma. We'd love to, we'd love to connect with folks that are interested. We're um, you know, an early stage company. We're about 60 people. Uh, we're growing rapidly. Uh, we're raising capital and, and hiring. We've got about 15 open roles. Um, if, if you'd like to reach out, um, absolutely would love to connect directly. My email is monik, M-A-N-I-K, at hellotherma.com. Our website is hellotherma, 
Facebook.com. We're on Twitter and LinkedIn and would love to connect on social. Uh, please check out uh, some of our public uh, materials. But if you'd like to connect, definitely reach out to me at any point. Uh, would love to chat further. It's again, Monik at HelloTherma.com. Great. Monica, we have about three minutes to go here, so I want to just sneak in one more uh, thought for you, maybe look in your crystal ball. And uh, what, what's your thoughts on the, the use of technology in general going forward to help alleviate sustainability where you know, maybe policy doesn't necessarily cut the mustard? Huge opportunity, Dave. I think that, uh, uh, you know, human ingenuity and our ability to, to solve the problems that we create um, is something I, I fundamentally believe in. You know, I think we see that happening throughout human history. And so the climate crisis is certainly something that is going to consume more and more attention just because the problem is not getting that much better. As the latest UN IPCC and other reports have pointed out, we still have a ton of work to do. But the technology solutions that exist today are just beginning to be deployed around this crisis. And so I think we're going to see all kinds of capital, human and financial, flow into this burgeoning climate technology sector, regardless of what happens with the economy over the next three months, nine months, couple of years, this is a multi-decade problem that's not going away. So I'm very uh, bullish on the climate tech sector and talking to a lot of folks that work in tech or want to work in technology, I hear repeatedly that people want to have impact with their work and want to feel like the work matters. I can't think of a more significant problem than the climate and sustainability because it affects literally all of us and all the future generations. So it's certainly as important a problem as others, um, you know, and, and, and there's lots of technology to be built. Huge gaps still. I think 35% of the technologies that need to exist to solve the climate crisis are not yet developed. That's a huge number, just to use one statistic. Yeah, and, and to your point, people do want to be involved in something that's bigger, and this is a, a great mission to get involved with. Monica, we're going to take a quick pause here. Don't go anywhere. Uh, you watching and listening, sit tight. We're going to pay a few bills, and we'll be right back on Behind the Numbers after this quick break. All right, ladies, that is a wrap for today's Talk 65. Now that we're done filming, we wanted to talk to you directly. Do you have any questions about maybe some of the topics you've seen on one of our shows? Or are you new to Medicare or just need help understanding your options for Medigap, Medicare Advantage, or prescription drug coverage? Annette, Patricia, and myself are licensed health insurance brokers that specialize in everything Medicare. So give us a call. We're, We're here, here to, to help. Mmm, cheesy grooves. Flavor, flavor, flavor! Woo! Crunch! She's the groove. So much flavor, it's a mind crunch. Let's face it. Lawyers get a bad rap. I'm Erin Bruschi, host of Legal Breakdown, where we dissect legal topics for the everyday viewer. With a mix of interesting guests, to talk about current events and hot legal topics, let's work together to make the law accessible and relevant to everyone. Catch us every week on RVN Television. And welcome back to Behind the Numbers. I'm Dave Bookbinder, and today we're talking with Monik Suri, who's the founder and CEO of Therma. Monik, welcome back to Behind the Numbers, round two. Uh, good conversation there in the first segment. I want to kick off this second segment by talking about um, what I call your journey of entrepreneurship. So what inspired you? I mean, we talked about the, the, the issue of sustainability and climate change, but what actually drove you to start to think about it in the context of building a business and really doing something about it? Yeah, uh, definitely, uh, uh, you know, a central question, I think, uh, about how to have impact in the world that I was facing in my 20s. I thought I was going to be uh, a government uh, policy uh, guy. That was my original plan. And so after um, going to law school, I worked uh, briefly um, as a junior uh, economic policy analyst in the Obama White House uh, on the National Economic Council team. I had a chance to see how challenging policymaking can be, how political policy is. I think that was what struck me, that you could have great ideas, 
but getting great ideas turned into legislation and regulation was ultimately a political game and a political uh, nightmare at the time. That was 2011 when, um, you know, we couldn't get even basic, um, you know, legislation through like raising the debt ceiling in the U.S., which had been a non-controversial issue for decades. That wasn't even getting done. So at the time, I was feeling very, uh, you know, frustrated and very concerned about how to actually make an impact as a policy person. And I met a, a woman, the, the deputy CTO, Beth Novick, she'd written a book called WikiGov about a technology was transforming the world. And the thesis of the book was that there were huge public problems uh, around sectors like government and law that were not being touched by a lot of the technology that was being developed. Uh, and while pizza delivery was getting faster and our ability to share photos was getting better, uh, there was just huge public problems that were staring us in the face. And so I, I got inspired by the book and, and the idea that one could actually build tech for good in terms of deploying products and services at scale to help attack big problems that are complex and where government policy wasn't meeting the mark. And that's really what led me to, to leave government and start working in tech. We started a center at NYU together, an MIT called the Governance Lab that's still around. That was about a decade ago. And that's when I started thinking, well, technology can actually change society and change human behavior. And, and if you build the right type of tools, you can actually attack big, challenging problems. Not that I don't like pizza delivery. I love my pizza and, and I use a lot of photo sharing apps now that I have an 11 month old, but I wanted to work on problems that I felt were not being tackled by some of my friends uh, who were venture capitalists or entrepreneurs in tech at the time. Yeah, one of the things that comes up a lot when I'm, I'm interviewing entrepreneurs uh, is the idea about building teams and how critical that is. And you know, sometimes the early hires are going to be the ones that are going to be the difference makers in your long-term trajectory. So as you're going through that, talk about how you're going about building teams. It's all about the people. That is something that I heard and, and, and now have come to understand at a different level. It really is uh, the single biggest, I think, factor in, in what det determines success in, in entrepreneurial ventures, probably in all organizations, but certainly in entrepreneurship. The, um, the hardest thing I found was recognizing when I was allowing myself to compromise or allowing myself to, uh, you know, to, to kind of act from a place of expediency. Just, oh, we need, to, we need to fill this role. We need to make a move now. So let's just go. We'll, we'll work with whoever we can get or we'll kind of move forward right away with, with the burden hand. While sometimes you do need to move fast, it is really important to keep the bar high and to, to feel, as someone put it to me recently, you always want to be the, he, as he said, I always want to be the least smart person in the room. If you're the least smart person in the room, you're doing something right. If you're the smartest person in the room, you know, you should probably reevaluate your choices. And so I think that that, um, that kind of mindset of like always leveling up, always looking for people that are uh, that have skills or experiences or both that are different in, in many ways, uh, level you up. That's something that I've tried to internalize more and more. Um, and so I say to our team now, this is the best team we have ever had. Today is literally the best team we have ever had. And next week should be the best team we've ever had. And the week after that, the team should constantly be getting better. That requires hiring and partnering with folks that are, you know, have skills and experiences that challenge you and that, that push you in ways that, that, that may be uncomfortable, but that's, that's critical to success. Yeah, and then keeping them, retaining them, especially in, in this environment that we're in now, you mentioned at the top of the program, you're looking to hire people. Uh, keeping them is, is as critical as finding new ones. And part of that is, is culture. So um, other CEOs that I've interviewed uh, have said, it's about being intentional. You, you have to be focused and intentional in implementing culture. Uh, how are you doing that at Therma? Couldn't agree more with that. I think the phrase, you know, culture eats strategy for breakfast, a kind of famous management principle, uh, is absolutely true and truer in startups, you know, even in, in large organizations. I think that culture is, you know, one of those things that's hard to see, but you know it when you experience and live it. And so we've got the ability to know when we're living through or, or working through a culture that feels positive. We also know when we're, we're in a negative environment. I think it's a function of authenticity and intentionality and also being able to say, hey, this is not a situation where I believe I can actually continue to flourish. To create an environment where people feel they can flourish, you have to allow their voice to be heard. You have to take feedback as a leader and you have to give feedback. All of those things, I think, help shape culture. So 
Uh, we've tried to create quarterly on-site off-sites where the entire team across North America gets together, uh, which is one way of trying to kind of build trust and build understanding. We've tried to implement a series of initiatives over the last year where we're walking the walk, where the organization is starting to reduce its carbon footprint, starting to change how we think about supply chain, packaging, customer success, to be more pro-climate. That's an example of trying to be more authentic. Um, when we say we want to build technology that reduces emissions, we should also think about our actions in, at the team and company level. Uh, and I think that ultimately it's about hiring again. Having the right people in the room and having the right people around the table ultimately is what shapes the culture. Because one person, whether you're the CEO or you know whatever your role is, cannot build the culture. It's ultimately created by the entire org. And so keeping the filters around uh, who you hire and what their mindset is high and, and, and trying to stay very, very uh, tightly aligned about that. Uh, is, is key to protecting the culture that you build. Yeah, and you said you're looking to hire folks. I would like to think that as uh, people are watching and listening to this conversation, uh, you've done a great job and you're going to be uh, flooded with resumes after people have heard your philosophy. Uh, tell folks how they can uh, connect with you if they want to you know, submit their application or even more importantly, just get to know more about you and Therma. We'd love to connect. Uh, we're definitely in growth mode. We've got over a dozen open roles. We're uh, close to 60 people on the team right now based out of uh, the Bay Area, but we're hiring fully remote. Um, please feel free to reach out to me directly. Uh, my email is monik, M-A-N-I-K, at hellotherma.com. That's monik at hellotherma.com. Uh, we're online at uh, hellotherma.com. We're on Twitter and LinkedIn. So uh, please follow us and, and, and check out our materials and what we're building uh, online. And again, if you're interested, check out our open roles. We've got positions across product, marketing, sales, engineering, design, really the full stack. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here and, and appreciate everyone taking a few minutes to, to get to know what we're building. Yeah, Monica, we've got about five minutes to go here in the program. It goes very, very quickly. But I want to get to a, a spot that a lot of entrepreneurs want to hear um, your counsel on. As everyone is growing their business, one of the key milestones is when it's time to raise capital. What's that process like and how can entrepreneurs prepare for that? Yeah, well, it's definitely, you know, I think that there's many, many things that have been said and written about fundraising and, and capital formation. Um, sometimes the best, I think, lessons are learned from experience. And I would say, having done close to 500 pitches at this point, I'm a little better today than when I did my third or fifth pitch. <laughs> so there is something to be said for repetitions. Like with anything in life, mastery comes from a combination of you know, applied effort and, and, and learning from your mistakes. So I'd say the single biggest uh, lesson or the lessons that I've taken away, maybe this, the, the couple are don't identify um, your sense of self with what you're putting out in the world. That's easy to say and hard to do, but um, I got a lot of rejection. The first time I went out to raise capital, I think my hit rate was about 10% uh, or less, you know, which means that, you know, nine out of 10 conversations I had ended up with a, you know, thanks very much for your time or no, no, thank you. And it's very easy and natural for us to take that as a personal rejection. Yeah. Um, and I think what, what um, I've been trying to in, you know, internalize from, from friends and mentors and colleagues is that that's feedback, not a personal rejection. That's feedback about the idea set or the timing or the business model or the person and the fit with, with what you're trying to offer and what they're, what they're um, trying to invest in. It's not necessarily about you. It's generally not about you. And if it is, then you should try and understand, okay, what are the things that are, are in your control to shift? And so, um, you know, I think that, that, that being able to learn from the feedback, but not to identify and treat it or think of it as a personal feeling is key. Uh, it's what has allowed some of the best uh, I think entrepreneurs and leaders to quickly learn from their mistakes. And that's as true of any part of life as it is in fundraising. And then you can move much faster, not necessarily get bogged down in the rejections and, and keep cycling through and finding opportunity by looking for people and learning from the, the feedback that you get. That's definitely how, you know, I've seen fundraising work. The first couple of pitches, you get feedback, you internalize that, you change the messaging, you change the business model, you think about whatever it is that's being questioned, the product, the market, the team. Uh, so I think that, that that type of fast learning is critical. The other thing is to think of it as a, a process. It's definitely, um, you know, there's cycles to these things. Sometimes you have to get started before you know exactly who you're selling to or exactly who um, your, your ultimate 
uh, you know, end customer is. And learning through the fundraising process is a great way to improve and refine the business. I find that I'm constantly taking notes and taking feedback from investors because they're seeing a lot of businesses and seeing a lot of trends and a lot of things that are and aren't working. So if you can treat it as a kind of continuous learning opportunity and also move fast and not necessarily get bogged down in the in the negative feedback in the times when people pass, um, then I think you can really start to move into higher and higher levered situations where you're taking the feedback, growing, improving the pitch, and then your hit ratios go up. And that's what I've seen. You know, the hit ratio on the last round was closer to 50% as opposed to under 10% in terms of the kinds of, uh, you know, uh, yes versus no feedback from investors. And that's true regardless of how much you're raising. If you're raising 100,000 or 100 million, the general, I think, principles apply. And I would also think of it as a, as a, a team effort. Uh, tap your network, tap your friends, ask people who are in the industry or have built companies alongside or similarly minded uh, and ask them for inputs on the deck, on the business plan, on the model, on the team construction, ask them for introductions. Scaling yourself by having others around you helping is a huge way to improve both the velocity, but also to make it feel less painful and less lonely. It can be very painful and lonely. And you know, I can tell you getting lots of rejections early on was not easy. Um, much harder to be an entrepreneur in many ways than an investor. I was an investor. My first job out of Harvard College, I worked at one of the biggest hedge and private equity funds in the world, pretty uh, famous fund called D.E. Shaw. When you're an investor, everyone is taking your meetings. Everyone's coming to you and saying, hey, we'd love to hang out. No one says no. When you're an entrepreneur, it's very, it's very much the opposite. Uh, you know, so, so there's something very humbling about being on this side, but also gratifying. That's great advice and a great conversation, Monica. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but I really want to thank you for sharing your story and telling us about Therma. Appreciate the opportunity. Great to be here. Enjoyed the conversation, Dave. Look forward oh, to connecting with folks. I'm looking forward to having you back on the program sometime down the road and tell us what you're up to, if you're open looking to, that. to that. Thanks, thank so. you. We've been talking with Monica Story, the founder and CEO of Therma. And my name is Dave Bookbinder, and I'm the one that my clients turn to when they want to know what their most important assets are worth. You can find me on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. I am always happy to have a conversation. And as always, thank you for watching and listening. We can't do this program without your support. If you haven't already done so, please hit the subscribe button so you can stay in touch with everything that we're up to. And that's it for today, folks. We will see you next time on Behind the Numbers. Take care.